Um, thank you for coming. Um, this is going to be, I think, a good follow-up on Evan's nice talk this morning. Um, we had a really nice discussion last year here with our uh, first meeting of the AI and ML initiative within systems, uh, within the cyber infrastructure group. Um, so as a follow-up, we decided to get together some knowledgeable folks who have been working on this, um, mostly from academia, but we do have one representative from industry, um, to give us a little bit of an insight and open the floor for panel questions. So I will just introduce the panelists real fast. We'll have a couple very quick presentations from the panelists. Then we're going to open the floor to questions and uh, a little bit of follow-up at the end. Um, so I will just go down the row here from my right to left. Um, at the end, we have Evan Goldstein from UNC Greensboro. You heard from him this morning. Um, we have Daniel Buscom from uh, Northern Arizona University, who is a last-minute exciting addition to our panel. Um, we have Sophie Giard um, from uh, CU Boulder here, a postdoc, and uh, Steve Sane from uh, Jupiter Intelligence, a local um, startup using AI machine learning. So uh, without further ado, um, yeah, Sophie, would you like to take it away? That's that. It should be on. Talk uh, directly in. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just, I just have two slides about two works that I am doing now, but mainly what I do is trying to work to apply machine learning techniques and to develop new machine learning techniques to specific atmospheric or climate um, applications. Um, so this work, so I actually work with Claire Monteleoni, who is also uh, a professor here, so you might know her. Um, this work was actually trying to predict the forecast, so forecast hurricanes, uh, forecast tracks specifically, um, and this from a database. So not trying to use models, but a database and actually reanalysis data. So we came up with like a neural networks that actually is a new type of neural networks because we had to fuse different types of data. So here comes like what I try to see as combining um, what like some specific uh, machine learning te techniques, so neural networks, but trying to put them into a specific uh, problem, which is we have different uh, set of types of data, how do we combine them? So this was the first work. I am now working also on trying to detect avalanche depositions or uh, avalanche, I think you can call it different ways. I, I hope deposition is a fine way, fi fine word uh, in, Eng in English. And this from SAR data, so I guess you might knows this kind of satellite data and so the goal here is how you can we can adapt some techniques some machine learning te techniques on uh, data that is actually kind of uh, blurry but also uh, where we don't have a lot of uh, ground truth labeling labeling which is where we know where an avalanche has occurred or not so i'm not going to enter into details then i have just one slide about what i think should be um, collaborations between machine learning and experts. So machine learning, when usually when they try to um, apply their methods, what they look is just data, whatever data, to test their new cool algorithm. But actually, they don't really care about what they are solving, and usually they're solving some completely uh, useless problems. On the other hand, um, if you're uh, an expert on whatever field, I worked previously on, on medical uh, images, so that's why you see a, a, a medical guy. Um, usually, you have a cool problem, and you try really to solve that uh, with machine learning methods. But because you don't know a lot about it, usually you're using some wrong solutions. But I don't blame you. Um, and I think if we combine the two, but combining really means to try to go back and forth between the two worlds, then we can end up in, in making some good research. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. We're gonna hold questions until both presentations and then open the floor entirely. So next will be uh, Steve from Jupiter. Yeah, sorry, just making sure it's on. Um, Hi, my name is Steve Sane. I, uh, I head up the data science team at Jupiter Intelligence. Uh, we're a, about a two-year-old startup uh, with offices here in Boulder, San Mateo, and New York City. Um, my background maybe is a little bit interesting. I'm actually a statistician by training. Uh, did my, uh, I sort of started off as a traditional academic, 
uh, spent a bunch of years at NCAR heading up something called the Geophysical Statistics Project that was in the Math Institute for a number of years. And then, you know, four or five years ago, I, uh, I decided to go be a data scientist, whatever that means. Um, ended up uh, working for a company based out of, out of San Francisco. And then the opportunity to join Jupiter, you know, roughly a year and a half or so ago arose. And um, here I am. Uh, so what is Jupiter? Um, you know, uh, we get a lot of good jokes about Jupiter, uh, Jupiter notebooks, you know, the, the planet, do I know how, all these other things. But really what we're trying to do is try to provide asset level probabilistic climate risk information uh, about different hazards that might be affected by extreme weather and climate change. So we currently have products in the uh, sort of in, in, the, in the flood space. Uh, we also have products that focus on extreme heat. Uh, we're developing a product uh, that should be, you know, uh, depending on how you count sometime this year on wildfire and, and exploring a number of different other opportunities. Um, our clients span, you know, the gamut from anybody who has an interest in that asset on the ground, right? So it, it, it could be the property owner itself. It could be the, the people who finance the, the loan to buy that property. It could be the insurance agencies uh, or insurance companies or the reinsurance companies that are, that are trying to handle the risk for that property, as well as different municipalities uh, basically around the globe. Um, if we wanna sort of dive in a little deeper into thinking about what we try to do, uh, take the example of, of, of coastal flooding. Uh, coastal flooding, uh, probably a lot more experts on this in this room than I am, but you know, you might think of, a, of, of coming from three, three different sources that we, that we typically try to model, uh, extreme rainfall, tropical cyclones, and then the growing sort of interest in, in sunny day flooding, right? You just happen to have a high tide, the wind blowing the wrong direction. You get enough water, you start closing down streets. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem in many coastal areas. Um, our, our pipelines are sort of built to do you know, different kind of dynamic weather, weather modeling, um, timed with coastal surge modeling, and then of course, uh, hydraulic modeling to, to wrap all of this stuff up. And then of course, pushing it into a statistics module that, that then brings uh, bring our risk estimates to, uh, to our clients. Um, and of course, driving all of this are some, some underlying assumption about changing rainfall, sea level rise that, that sort of go along with uh, uh, different assumptions people wanna make about climate change. Okay, so, Right now, our focus on machine learning has a lot to do with trying to figure out where our pain points are, especially as we try to do things uh, more efficiently, right? i.e. cheaper. Uh, we do everything in the cloud, so every penny counts. Um, we also are trying to scale, right? Most of, when we're talking about asset level information, we're talking about results that are, say, at meters type scale, um, over tens to hundred and hundreds of, hundreds of millions of locations in a particular domain. So as we try to build those efficiencies, as we try to scale, our pain points have, have come up and, and machine learning is a way, uh, one tool that we're trying to use to address some of those pain points. Many of them are probably not unfamiliar to you guys. Uh, you know, simple fact of the, the historical record is incomplete. We have to deal with missing data all the time, right? Missing data is something that we can try to use machine learning to tell us uh, you know, how to infill those results. Um, there's also not a lot of it especially when we start talking about extremes. Um, the, the data quantity is pretty small when you just want to start talking about, say, a 100-year flood risk. So there's this concept of, of weather generators that also comes to rise. Uh, downscaling, uh, you know, I already mentioned the fact that we're trying to do things at, at sort of a meter scale type resolution. So downscaling our, our dynamical models becomes even more important as well. Uh, Something I'm just sort of getting involved with right now, uh, hydro conditioning DEMS to sort of drive our uh, hydraulic models, lots of problems there. Um, and machine learning can, can play a role in all of these things. Um, my personal view is, is I simply try to find the best solution for the job, okay? So whatever problem is at hand, that could be a linear regression or it could be a deep learning model. Frankly, I don't care. I just want something that's gonna solve the problem and you know, my engineers aren't gonna scream at me when they try to implement. Um, we use a lot of different things. Random forest is sort of a, a very nice, all-purpose, uh, very general entry level. I, I don't know, I hope I don't insult anybody, kind of machine learning uh, technique that, 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 that we like a lot. We use it for downscaling. We use it for a lot of infilling uh, when we have missing data. So it, it's sort of a nice, all-purpose sort of machine learning algorithm. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, recurrent neural networks uh, to deal with some of our sequence data, say like hydrological flows. Um, to also to address some of the missing data problems that we're facing there. 
convolutional neural networks. We have a project spinning up uh, looking at convolutional neural networks to sort of help out with some of our, our downscaling problems. And then sort of uh, a, a bit of an exploratory problem, thinking about the weather generation idea. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do this within a traditional statistical format, but we're also looking at, at generative models like, like GANs to sort of think about uh, how we might, you know, s generate hundreds if not thousands of, say, precipitation fields to, to help drive our, our models as well. Um, very quick overview. Um, hope, that, hope that works. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, so now we're going to open the floor to questions and then just kind of pass the microphone down the row of our panelists to weigh in on any sort of uh, pressing questions or concerns we have. So be loud and uh, we'll repeat the question and uh, the floor is open. So the question was, is the pain point referring to the model in particular or the facility? Yeah, I, I think I was speaking more part of the modeling pipeline, right? Um, whether that's, uh, you know, in the historical data that we sort of need to, to start driving the model or in the entire sort of simulation process, right? Um, again, you know, you're, you're trying to simulate something that's got, um, you know, 100 million grid boxes and you need thousands and thousands of simulations. You need to do something a little more efficiently. Is machine learning different than super fancy curb fitting? No, I, I th yeah, no, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think it's a totally valid question and a good question. I think that uh, what I was speaking about is just a simple example. And simple examples tend to look like curve fitting examples, but it's a, as a subdiscipline, it's as diverse, if not more diverse, in the topics being studied than, um, uh, than a lot of the a lot of earth science subdisciplines. So there's a lot going on. I just had this one reductive viewpoint of it that I wanted to present to you. But I'm going to actually pass the microphone to Alok. That's my perspective. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Um, I guess my perspective on this is in general that a machine learning algorithm is something that's going to end up telling you what the rules are. And a statistical approach is going to be more in line with uh, these are a set of prescribed rules that you need to follow. You need to find the roots of a poly polynomial, for example, in a certain way. And a machine learning algorithm is a much more data agnostic. It doesn't assume so many things. Um, it, and it, it often can even get you the same answer than a statistical model can. Yeah, no, I think I agree with what was said. Roughly, you can view some of the machine learning techniques as just curve fitting, or, but it goes way more than that, I would say. This is like the simple example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Being a statistician by training, I, I always sort of, um, uh, I don't think, I, I personally am not sure. I think the lines are a lot more blurred than, than um, what really, what, what is the true reality. And, and there are certainly places where statistics is, is more appropriate. And there's certainly places where machine learning works more. But, but I think the biggest thing here is, is calling it curve fitting just doesn't do it justice because the problems that we're facing have so much structure 
so much sort of going on that it, it, it's so far beyond fitting a curve or a, even a surface. Um, and, and the ability to sort of, as, as somebody sort of alluded to, be able to infer that from the data directly is, is, is pretty powerful. And, you know, kind of calling it curve fitting is you know, just, I mean, I think that's a little weak, honestly. We have uh, more questions right here. So how does machine learning handle outliers compared to traditional statistical models is the question. Maybe I, I can just start by saying that there are some machine learning methods that are kind of very rub, robust to, to that. For example, the simple, I would say simple, they, they were very fancy five years ago, uh, super ve vector machines are actually finding some vectors, so some points of the data that will uh, try to just uh, find, for example, a, a classification, you want to classify two classes, you will just find the few points that you need to make your uh, decision boundary, but you, you will not at all depend on very far points. So in that case, you completely avoid outliers. Um, I would say that it's a, like a data-driven driven method in any ways, uh, machine learning. So of course, if you have too many outliers, you will have a problem, but generally, because it's a data-driven method, it might also be robust to, to very like different types of data. So again, it, it depends on the method. It, it's not a general response. Uh, when I mean robust is that because it starts from data, it's robust to, 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 like to noise in the data, right? Because you learn from that. Um, but then, uh, it depends. I, I cannot really answer to, it depends on the method and of course on the outliers. So maybe do you have an example on that? I never really worked with specific outliers. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, outliers, particularly with sparse data sets, with smaller data sets, are a giant problem, right? And it doesn't really matter if you're using a traditional statistical method or, or a machine learning method. You, you know, you, you've got to be a little bit careful. Overfitting is always a problem. But, but there are methodologies that, that are robust. And by, when I say robust, I'm, I'm basically meaning that the, the, the results are not unduly influenced by those outliers, right? It's, it's sort of an old concept in statistics. Of, of sort of thinking about, you know, how I fit, fit a regression line. Do I use, you know, traditional least squares or L1 that, that sort of minimizes the impact of potential events or, or potential outliers? Um, so, so it is a challenging problem. There's no, there's no, I don't think there's any great solution. It, it, it just requires a little bit of care and thinking about how you apply it, particularly with smaller data sets. I don't know if you guys got it. Uh, yeah. I don't have a, a specific example, but I mean, a couple of just a couple of general points is that, um, you know, some machine learnings are very machine learning algorithms are very data hungry. And so you'd want there to be similar outliers in both your training and your testing and your validation data sets. And if you don't have that, then you have a problem just straight off the bat. Um, what was the other point that I was thinking of? No, oh, it, 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 it's, it's lost. Uh, sorry.
comments on interpretability of machine learning results. I mean, there's lots of standard techniques out there for looking at the partial dependencies of your variables. And I mean, there's things that have translated from statistics to machine learning. Um, there's lots of data visualization techniques out there that would, would definitely guide you in interpreting black box models, such as deep neural networks, for example. You end up um, simplifying everything and show it and showing those results so that all those dependencies on things like decision trees that you can see okay there was a there was a split here and there was a binary threshold that was reached and and things like that um but there's a there's a lot that needs to be done in that area especially in our field i mean i don't think that um many machine learning applications in geosciences are, are really dealing with um the problem of interpret interpretability I would just comment that sometimes that's also the good thing about machine learning is that you can actually model something even if you don't know what the, the physics are underlying, right? Because if you have a model and it works, you don't need machine learning. But if you don't, then it's because actually you cannot model. So in that case, having even a black box is already a good thing, right? I think then the next level is to try to really Try how you can couple the two in a good way so, so that you use the, the most of the modeling and the most of the machine learning. But that's another question. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything. I, I mean, I think there's a, maybe a couple more points, right? I mean, causality is, is, is sort of a, a, a new and growing area. Um, and, and, you know, while it's being sort of driven, I think, a, a, in a lot of like uh, biomedical sciences and, and oddly enough, in uh, you know, I have a colleague who's been in digital advertising for a number of years, and, and they're very concerned about sort of causal models and, and causality there. So it's being driven in a couple of areas. It is sort of starting to move into sort of the machine learning area. Um, there's, there's also a lot of growing things where, where you, you might think your machine learning model is, is, is going to be sort of constrained, so it doesn't give you sort of non-physical results. So, so that's part of these areas, not only diagnost, diagnosing or or the diagnostic side of understanding sort of what your model is figuring out, um, but, but, but sort of helping the model along the way. Um, those are, that, that's sort of a growing area. But I would also say this is, this is where that interaction is so important and that collaboration even that, that, that you were mentioning between sort of the data scientist or the machine learning expert and, and the domain scientist become even more important. Um, that communication sort of has to be there. You, I, I, I believe the best, the best way this works is when you sort of have that good kind of collaboration. You, you, you put in the effort to, to be speaking the same language. It's amazing how many times, you know, you're talking about the same thing, but you're using completely different words. And so nobody knows what the hell is going on. Um, but that's where it also is important for, you know, to say, hey, yeah, um, you know, the model says put the baby next or the diapers next to the beer. And you're like, huh? Or maybe that's totally logical. I, I don't know, right? Um, you know, but 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 there's a lot of those things that, that that I think that conversation is what's so important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that, that's also where I, I, I think it's very important that you have that interaction. You, you're right. When you, when you sort of move out of the physical, geophysical world, you know, if I'm looking at customer churn or I'm looking at a, a market basket analysis or I'm just trying to classify cats, whatever, whatever you want. I mean, yeah, you could argue that, you know, machine learning models aren't, aren't constrained. They're just trying to find the structure that exists in the data. And that's why they're so powerful, um, because sometimes that structure is really complicated. Um, but, but again, that's sort of where that conversation has to, has to be important. And, and ultimately it depends. Um, you know, I've, I've, 
I worked at a company looking at customer churn and honestly, you know, really all they wanted was classifications of people. Um, so that, so that the sales staff could go out and, and, and talk to the ones that we thought were at risk. They didn't really care why they just, they just wanted to know. So it, it sort of depends on what you're after. If you, if you're after the learning, you know, you, you might choose a different approach. If you just want pure predictions of yes or no, then maybe you choose a different approach. For the sake of time, we're going to have to conclude, but, uh, just like to have everybody thank our panel again for uh, coming and attending. Thanks, Chris, and thanks again to all of our panelists. How many of you thought this discussion was too short? All right, me too. So here's where you can go from here. First, this is part of the new CSDMS Machine Learning Initiative, or AI and ML on the web page here. If you Google CSDMS Machine Learning, this will come up. You can talk to us and to each other on Twitter, if you're feeling graphical and maybe as sarcastic as our Twitter is, and on our Google group, CSDMS AI and ML, where you can share data sets, ask technical questions, and generally start the kinds of conversations that we've been talking about. The conversations that bridge boundaries, that bring machine learning and mechanistic models together on this webpage with each other with any other experts you can find. And then finally, Twitter is a little bit exciting. Google Groups, sometimes beer, usually. So we'll also be talking at about 5.30 at Backcountry Pizza and Brew Pub this evening, 5.30 to 6.30. You can see us there if you want to continue this conversation. Thank you.